sure he'll talk to you a little bit about his, his transition here from um, being director of IT shared services and strategy and head of the IT profession within Northern Ireland civil service. Barry's task here in, in some ways is quite a profound and revolutionary one because he's introducing government's IT strategy and I think today Barry would be very interested to see how you're going about that. As you know, the government sees a real opportunity for Ireland as a leading digital entity. But really, it's also about how do you introduce um, technology, digital services, shared service and data into people's everyday lives, into civil society, into community, into business. And of course, I suppose your task is to see how does the government lead the way in that transition. So we look forward to hearing okay. your presentation. <laughs> Thank you very much. What I'm going to talk to you about um, this afternoon is just one aspect of the um, public service ICT strategy. There's five pillars to the strategy, which I'll very briefly cover. But the one that uh, I'm going to talk about today is the whole idea of digitizing Ireland. And uh, I think that's a source of, um, of great debate, uh, or potential debate. Um, in one of the slides, uh, I'll mention Estonia. And Estonia is a country that's not dissimilar to Ireland in terms of size and, and population. It's a bit smaller, it's about 1.3 million, we're at we're four. But it is a completely digital country. Um, but uh, the reason, one of the reasons why it's a completely digital country is it's a country completely without legacy. When the Russians left Estonia, they literally took everything with them. Their art, their music, their artifacts, everything. And it was almost, well, if you're building a country and all you've got is technology, what would it look like? Um, we live in a country where we're very, very proud of our culture and our heritage. We're not called the land of saints and scholars for nothing. And what does digital mean in that sort of context? That's a question, by the way. I'm not going to answer it, but it might be one choice where, where you'll get me an answer during the debate afterwards. So... Um, during the springtime, uh, there was a, an event by Gartner. So Gartner would be um, leading world analysts in the whole area of technology and, and digital and, and so on. And this guy, Mark Ruschino, is, is one of their lead analysts. And he wrote a book with another one, a guy called Graham Waller, called Digital to the Core. And when Mark presents... He is a very forthright presenter, which makes it very interesting, of course. And one of the statements he made in the spring in the Marriott Hotel was, we're moving into the world where you go digital, where you go home. Uh, and of course, then he, he talked about what he meant. Now, this was a piece of research that I did. And apologies at the back, because you, know, you might be able to read this. But I'll just explain it to you. This is a, a study, a worldwide study that PricewaterhouseCoopers does every year of the biggest com companies in the world. And the, this particular slide is the fastest growing companies in the world. And it's very interesting because at the top are Apple and, and Google. Um, and then there's a lot of banking and this doesn't answer the question about whether these banks have used digital to get ahead or whether they just happen to be ahead. But there's also very traditional companies there as well. There's a lot of pharmacy. Um, you have Toyota's, the car company. Um, and you have Anheuser-Busch from Belgium, which I didn't actually know what they do. <laughs> but they're actually the firm who make Bex, Stella Artois and an awful lot of the drinks that, that, that would be consumed in Dublin of an evening. Um, so in many respects, that doesn't particularly answer the question about 
if you do not go digital, are, are you in a, a state of rapid decline that you may or may not be aware of? But of course, there's, ans there, there's other organisations that answer that question. And there's a lot of people show this slide in various forms. Now, um, despite being a CIO, I'm a very tactile person and I love records and, and books and, and, and art and all of those sorts of things. And so it actually grieves me to see the demise of a lot of these uh, companies because there's not actually one in that list that I haven't bought something of in my, in my lifetime. But of course, you know, the, the, the whole world of technology has dramatically changed the, the world of music and, and, and reading uh, and uh, commerce and so on. And of course, the message behind this is that these are organisations who were late picking up on how technology would change their world and therefore are no more. Now, I'm sure there's other reasons why each and every one of those failed, but that would be the generalism that Gartner or, or, or other organisations would use about companies like this. So we're obviously living in a world where everything's changing and maybe you might say everything's changing except government, but that's not actually true either. And in government, our changes are coming from a number of, of different uh, routes. Um, we have a population that has different demands. Younger people have different demands from their parents and their grandparents and so on. Um, but one of the ways in which our, our, our world is being challenged is actually from Europe. And this guy here is Andrew Samsip, who is the former Prime Minister of Estonia. And he now works uh, for the European Union and he's one of their uh, commissioners and vice presidents. And his role is to take forward the European digital single market. Now there's many aspects to that role. So things like the cost of broadband, things like mobile charges, things like, um, which is a really difficult one to crack, things like um, geographical boundaries around media. So the fact that we can't watch the iPlayer um, I could talk for an hour about my problems trying to watch RTE even, uh, which is another story. But all of these rules, geographic rules about digital media and what you can watch and what you can listen to and so on. He's trying to break that down right the way across Europe. And even things like VAT and postal charges. So as it's as cheap to buy a package from Germany as it is from England, as it is from Ireland. So it's the road not without challenge. But, and that's why he says it's harder to create a digital single market than a physical one because, it, because of that. But one of the key things he talks about is that government has to lead the way in this. So if you were living in Germany for a short or longer term, if you were lucky enough to have a, a, a summer cottage in, in Portugal, France or, or Spain, you should be able to do business with your government as easily as if you were living in Dublin or Mayo or Wexford or wherever you're living. And that's a challenge for government as well. So let, let's talk about then Ireland uh, as a country because, you know, I was saying downstairs, government has many roles and one of them is to be at the core of the ecosystem that it lives and works within. So this is our ecosystem. This is a statistics produced by the Central Statistics Office in, in 2014. And again, um, for those of you at the back, I'll point out the key points here. 57% of the registered uh, companies in Ireland don't have an employee. In other words, they're one-man bands. White van man, as somebody uh, referred to them as. That's a huge uh, number of our, of our companies. If you turn that across to companies who employ 10 or more, that's 8%. Now, we're not obviously talking about their contribution to the country in terms of uh, in taxes and so on. In fact, maybe we shouldn't. Um, but this is a, a typical, I guess, uh, of, of a country like Ireland. You know, we have, we have a very entrepreneurial spirit, but we have, we have a, a ceiling to our ambitions. And I remember having a conversation 
with uh, the minister up in Northern Ireland, um, the uh, Minister for Enterprise, and they were saying that part of the problem in Northern Ireland is that people value their work-life balance too much. And what, what, what she meant by that was that you'll get great startups and all of a sudden they'll get to a level where there's six employees or eight employees and they're sort of managing being a good husband and father or wife and mother or whatever it is and running their business. And they suddenly see the next scale is going to require them to work 18 hours a day and have even more problems with staff and, leg and legislation, industrial. And they just think it's not worth it. And so this is a very much an Irish culture trying to escalate the SMEs to the global giants, even though there's huge potential there, is, a, is an issue in Ireland. And I'm not commenting on that in many respects. It feels like a good thing that, that, that we have this. We don't have this American sort of, you know, culture that if you're, if you're not, you know, if you're not up two hours before you went to bed, for some reason, you're not, you know, doing your job. So it, it, it's just our world that we live in. Um, when you take out the, 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 the small ones, even then, you know, 66% have one to four employees. So it sort of gives you a scale of what do we mean by digital challenge? Who are we talking about when we talk about firms that will sell across Europe and, and, and engage in that commerce and so on? So this is uh, back to Mark Ruschino and, and his book. He talks about if we're going to be part of this digital revolution, if we're going to be a digital success story, he'll say, first of all, we've got to remake ourselves as people. We've got to think differently about digital. Secondly, then, we've got to think differently about our, our companies. And thirdly, we've then got to think differently about um, our industry. And if you look at Apple, for example, and I'm old enough to remember when Apple nearly went the way of many IT companies, it was perilously close to going out of business. But somewhere along the line, Apple stopped being a maker of computers primarily and changed the whole culture of how we listen to music. And actually, it didn't do it with any technology. It invented itself. A lot of it came from elsewhere. But they created a value proposition, first of all, around music, then about the, the phone and so on. And that's what Apple do. Apple sell people visions. In many respects, they're as much a, a marketing comp, a company as, as, a, as a manufacturing company. But they changed the whole way that people thought about computing. And they started to change the whole way about how people thought about the industry and this blurring <coughs> of lines. And, you know, Rustino makes the point about when you're talking about the huge success, success stories in, in, in digital, you're talking about Airbnb, you're talking about Uber, you're talking about actually companies that don't do the stuff that they're famous for. Uber don't own taxis, you know. Um, Airbnb don't own accommodation. And yet that's what they're used for. So they've completely remapped what some of these things mean to, to us all. So back to government. Um, why is government different? Well, I guess the first thing is we don't really have competitors. You know, we're the government. You know, I mean, OK, at political level, there, there, there's obviously different parties and all that part of, of being a good democracy. But I mean, at the end of the day, government in terms of the civil service and the, the infrastructure and so on, it's just, it's just there. And uh, that possibly can be a good thing in terms of sustainability and so on. Um, but it also can be a bad thing in terms of complacence. Um, we don't pick and choose our, our, our customers. I, I was telling the story um, downstairs about my, my late mother. And she phoned me one day and she was very upset. And she got a letter from her bank saying that they'd, they were closing the local bank. And this was the bank that she had gone to for 40 years. It was almost part of her social life, you know, because she knew all the staff and she knew all the people that would go in there. And of course, they then went on to say in the letter, but this is all part of a brave new future and you'll have 
telebanking and all of this sort of stuff. And she said, what does this matter to me? And, and the banks can do it, probably have to do it, and will do it, whether their customers like it or not. So if you've been with a bank 40 years, they're not going to ask your opinion about closing the local bank. They just have to do what they have to do. And you either stay on the bus or, or you get off at the next stop. Government can't do that. Government has an obligation, in fact, arguably to the people who are less capable of, of moving with the times. And that's a challenge with this. We've got loads of stakeholders, so everybody's got an opinion about government. And um, I, I was speaking earlier at an event and I was using the example of the identifier. When you think of it, you would, you would not stay with the bank or a retail company that kept asking you for your information when you'd already provided it. You just wouldn't accept some of these things. And yet when government talks about doing it as a good thing, it gets hit with the media by Big Brother and infringing people's liberties and all of this. So government has so many stakeholders that every decision it makes, it can't win. You know, and, and it will have people who are furious about some of the things that it's trying to do, even where it tries to do them with the best reasons and the best intent. And unless we're Estonia with loads of legacy. So again, you know, it would be wrong for my minister to announce that he's dismantling the entire tax system because he's been to a Gartner conference and really what you should be doing to be digital is completely rebuild the processes from start to finish. You know, we've spent millions upon millions on, on what we've got and therefore there's an obligation to the taxpayer to exploit the value to, of that while we develop a new model. That's not a conversation that many businesses have uh, or certainly not to the same uh, extreme. And people losing their jobs is always the government's problem. So we were talking earlier on about Unpost and the fact that Government remains one of its biggest customers. In fact, maybe government is, is largely the lifeblood of Ampost at the minute because the likes of Department of Social Protection, Revenue and all are literally sending out millions of letters um, every week. Uh, the digital part of us would say we've got to stop doing that. It's part of the old world. But look at the implications if we do it. The post office is closed and so on. So it, it's difficult. So it's hard in government to redefine what success is and, and how, we, how we talk about success. So the e-government action plan, it, it talks about, as I said, government being a, a, a digital leader, government leading the way, being somewhat of a trailblazer. And these are the things that are specifically called out in it. So digital by default. And uh, you know, I was saying earlier on about um, one of the ways that Denmark have moved towards this is is they take the view that if you're capable of of of, um, of of carrying out transactions digitally with anyone, you're legally obliged to carry them out with government. That's their view, and they've got eighty eight percent uptake. Be interesting if a minister announced we were going to do that here. What the feedback would be like? Is it a good thing? Is it not? Once only principle. The idea is that you tell us once and we'll use many times. And again, I've touched on that, some of the sensitivities around it, but in the eyes of Europe, that's, that's the right way to go. It's a good thing. Um, inclusiveness and accessibility speaks for itself, as does openness and transparency. Cross-border by default, I've talked about, the idea is you can carry out a transaction with your, your home government, regardless of where you are in Europe, and regardless of the access device you're using. Uh, interoperability across governments, that's going to be a challenge <laughs> and trustworthiness and secure and uh, it was interesting because um, I, I, I was lucky enough to have a conversation with Andres Ansip and I was saying to him that in Ireland we see the counterbalance to e-government as being the data protection commissioner and actually we shouldn't we should see the counterbalance to e-government as being openness and transparency and that's where the Estonians are the Estonians it's Estonia is a fascinating place to go to because if you go into Estonia what they'll show you is they'll log on and they'll show you 
your record in government. They'll, they'll, you can check that it's correct and you can also check who's accessed it and why. And you can do that with your medical record as well. Now, when you talk about uh, inter interoperability and cross-border by default, if I was in Spain next week and I was ill, I would want that consultant to know everything about my medical records. What I don't want is people looking at it who aren't entitled to. So this is where this, this transparency is so important. We need to start putting in our, our citizens' minds that it's all about transparency and trust and not about... The, the, the whole argument at the minute is about effectively a core lack of trust of government. Um, wherever that's come from and whether it's deserved, that's, that's in my view, where we're about at the minute. And we need to, we need to redefine that argument. So in terms of um, league tables, European Union actually maintained one. This one's called the DESI League Table. And these are the best e-government countries in Europe, the, the 28. Uh, Ireland's here, and Estonia, Denmark, and Finland lead the way. Now, now the good thing uh, when you're in Ireland is that the United Kingdom, despite all the money they've spent, are still way ahead of us. This, I think league tables like this are a good thing and a bad thing. And, and league tables really, really test your culture and your metal when you're in government. And what I mean by that is, you know, to give you, to give you a soccer analogy, you know, if you're, and apologies to people who don't love or, or know, know much about soccer, but if you're the chairman of, say, a club like West Bromwich Albion, they sort of sit and, and, and their manager was making this complaint in the pre-season. He was talking about their board was happy with mediocrity because although they're miles away from the top, they're also comfortably away from the bottom and that's good enough. And in some respects, the challenge for Ireland is, is that good enough? Are we happy because we're so far away from the bottom? Or are we annoyed or challenged because we're still quite a bit of distance from the top? I'll leave you to think about that. You can make your comments later on. My view, personally, is the use of soccer parlance. Ireland is a Liverpool or a Chelsea or a Tottenham. Ireland should be asking itself, why it's not here. Now, if you wanted to know why it's not here, that's interesting. This is uh, the Estonia um, country profile. And as you can see, it is absolutely a digital nation. Um, I'll leave the slides and go through the various indicators. But in all the indicators they use, Estonia scores extraordinarily high. This is Denmark, who uh, also score very, very highly. You'd be very pleased with that. And this is Ireland. So, you know, there's things, obviously, that we can rush to fit. I mean, they're fixed. There's one pre-filled forms. So we just don't do enough digitally. We don't encourage enough digitally trans uh, tra We don't encourage enough digital transactions with our people and so on. So some of this, you could argue, need legislation and so on. But there's almost a more fundamental thing for us to fix before we get into any of that debate. So this is what the Estonians would say are the absolute critical success factors to be a successful digital government. So a trusted identification element, legally approved digital signatures, which obviously needs legislation and change of culture and so on. Integrated approach underpinned by a single digital identity. Clear plans to use identifiers and integration for visible benefits. In other words, tell us once in the transparent government. So actually in Ireland, we have a lot of these things in place. We just need to start to accelerate how we use them. And that's what the public service ICT strategy is about. Um, when, I, when I came down in April, one of the first things that was asked was, are you going to want to rewrite this? And I said, absolutely not. I, I think it's an excellent document. I don't think I could have written it any better. But there's five pillars. So build a share is basically how we're going to help fund some of the other stuff. So it's about kicking out duplication, doing more together, shared services and so on. Digital first, obviously, which is about our whole digital front end. 
being a data-driven government, so using data for improved uh, uh, policy making, all of those things, and uh, improving our governance, because obviously as you move to a more cohesive model, risk in terms of cyber security and all of those things goes up. So therefore governance and stewardship and auditability and all of those become even more important. And then the capability of our, our, of our people. And again, you'll, you won't go to any presentation in digital that doesn't touch on capability because it's a key part to be in a, a digital organization. So what have I been doing? Well, I've met all the secretary generals, the CIOs, various other stakeholders. And um, I've worked with the CIOs and the heads of IT in the department. So we now have an 18 step plan to deliver the strategy, which uh, I issued to the Civil Service Management Board in July. And uh, by the end of this month, I'm hoping for formal approval to go ahead, although we're going ahead anyway. Um, so we'll talk specifically about digital. What, what, what I found was there's a lot of very good departmental projects. So for example, uh, Gartner would say that revenue in terms of how tax is done as a digital service is in the top three in the world. You know, and, and it deserves to be. It, it's, it's very, very good. The whole passport system is excellent. And I'm sure you've all got examples as well uh, of your own dealings. The issue is that um, there's a lack of structure and cohesion. It doesn't look and feel the same in every transaction. And it's not easy to even understand the, the number of transactions you can do uh, digitally. So that was something. Um, we, we obviously had a new minister and a uh, minister of state. And the minister of state in particular has been given an e-government portfolio and he's very keen to take that forward. So when you've got a politician who's on side from the start, that's some, um, an opportunity you don't miss. Um, against that, as I said, there's a challenge of how we do legacy differently and there's the scale of our investment in existing systems. So some of these existing systems, as I said, we do need to exploit and run down gradually. It's not a case of just axing them. We couldn't afford to write off costs. So these are specifically the, the, the measures in the 18-point plan uh, to do with digital. And again, for those of you at the back, I'll just cover them briefly. But the first one is we're going to set up a, um, a digital program office. Because one of the things that I, as I said, I became aware of was we didn't have a dashboard. We've got a minister of state free government, but ministers need information. They need dashboards to manage. Like anybody who runs a company, you know, and I know some of you do, the first thing you'll be doing is setting up a dashboard of key, you know, success criteria, outputs, in, key performance indicators, whatever it is. And you'll have green, amber, red and, and, and all of those sorts of things. The minister didn't have that. So what we'll do is we'll start to create a programme of all the things that we're working on and some form of prioritisation, things that might need intervention, things that are going well and so on. So this is initially about let's not stop what we're doing. Let's get stuff out there. Um, the, the, the sort of maturity comes after that. You know, government doesn't have the luxury, as I said earlier, of some more agile private sector companies where you can stop what you're doing and do it completely differently. You know, government is a, is a big ship to turn. So even starting to get the digital out there will be important to us. Um, we're developing a, um, what we're calling a government digital service gateway. Some people call it a portal. Uh, Denmark and Estonia and a number of European countries have these. The high performance ones tend to have them. But the whole idea is if you're a citizen in Ireland, and especially if you're one of the, in Dublin, 20% of new citizens in Ireland, a very easy way to um, transact with, with government and understand where you go to get certain services and to route your way through. I'll come back to that because that's an important one for us. Um, a communications plan to make sure the public are aware of what we're doing and the media is aware of what we're doing and maybe the minister's recognised for some of the things that he's trying to do and then the whole um, working with the Department of Social Protection because we've got the MyGov ID, we've got the public service card, we've got something that is better than anywhere else in Europe which is a safe verification process and I don't know how many people in this room have a public service card 
But if you don't, I recommend you get one, as the minister did in August, even just to understand what a great process it is. Because you literally have to go there and you have to um, provide proof of who you are and where you live. They take a digital photograph of you, they take a digital signature of you, and that can then be used to verify any transaction that you use with government. And I noticed the Estonians announced this week that citizens are going to be able to take out a bank account without ever visiting a bank. That's because the government can provide the banks with the proper authentication that they need to let you open an account. Contrast that with the UK model, who are behind us. And here's just an anecdote. Um, there's a debate going on in Ireland at the moment about how much information a bank should be allowed to have, or the banking system should be allowed to have on us. And obviously <laughs> this is all driven by the crash and, and poor credit and all of those sorts of things. The UK, who famously failed with their concept of a public service card because uh, Gordon Brown insisted in calling it a national identity card um, and it was scrapped. They have struggled to verify their customers for digital services. So what they now do is they do their verification through a number of trusted parties. One of those parties is Experian, the Credit Reference Agency. So Experian are used by the government to say that if you lived in the UK, you are who you say you are. Experian will then contact you and say, did you know that for 15 quid a month, we can actually not only verify your details, but get you an excellent credit rating through our advice and all of this sort of thing. And Experian actually hold details in the UK of every single financial transaction that people have done. So, you know, people get suspicious of the model that we have here and where that's evolving to. Sometimes you need to look outside to see that maybe how we're doing it here is, is closer to what we feel is right. But that's the public service card and, and, and it's a very laudable, laudable you know, way forward. I would say that anyway, but it, it genuinely is. So let's go back to the... Um, to the whole idea of a service gateway, because I call this the Amazon, uh, the Amazon version of government. And again, I'd be very interested in hearing your views about this. Um, but if you think of Amazon, um, Amazon will let you go on, buy something, and completely rob your details out of their history, and that's it. If that's what your ch your choices of working with Amazon, that's absolutely fine by Amazon. They'll, they'll have that relationship with you. Now, what they'll say to you is, if you would like to give us your details and form a relationship with us, we can give you a better experience. So we know that if you like Bob Dylan, there's a fair chance you'll like Neil Young. Or we know if you like um, books by some author, if you like a biography on sportsmen, you might like the new Brano Driscoll biography or whatever it is. So they're starting to give you a better user experience just by knowing a little bit about you. And then the third thing about Amazon is the whole idea. It's almost a dating agency in terms of establishing an ecosystem. So what happens with Amazon, and I don't know, I'm sure most of you have used Amazon in the past, it starts to recommend partners to you that can sell you things that it doesn't necessarily sell you. And how it can do that is because it has authenticated you, it has your credit card details, it knows you're a good pair, and it's authenticated the partners to a degree that it knows that uh, they're not, we're gonna raid your bank account.com, they're robust, reliable, and it will give you a guarantee to underpin your transaction with them. So how does that work for government? So I talked about our portal initially being posting towards services, but then it's about registration and relationship building in government. So what does that mean? Well, that might mean if government knew that you had a child and it's leaving cert this year, 
when you logged on to the portal, it pushes stuff to you about third level education choices. Or if your child didn't get the degree choice, the university of its choice, has it considered um, apprenticeship schemes? Has it considered doing things, you know, a different type of course and so on? So it starts to be a much more citizen-led experience with government. Tell us once we use many. So this idea about we can start to bring together all our knowledge of you to try and give you a better experience. So we're not going to put you through the, the, the stress of having to apply for free health care because we already know you're entitled to it. So we start to have a much more engaging uh, relationship with the citizen. So what does an ecosystem look like with government at the core? And we, we were talking about this downstairs. It's a really, really interesting concept. And I'm sure if I give you one or two examples, you could come up with many better ones. But here's the best that I could do. Imagine, because obviously, what do we know? We know that Ireland is a place where people want to come and live and work and study. A lot of those people come from a long way away. So imagine if in our port hall, we were able to put up to say people from South Korea, Hong Kong or wherever, whose kids are gonna to come to university here, a list of recommended landlords, people who have been properly audited or properly registered and everything else. Two things start to happen through that relationship. First of all, somebody in Korea starts to get a list of properties that they know are bona fide properties. And the other thing is you start to create an impetus for people in the rental, private rental market to start to be assessed, to meet the various criteria, to start to comply. So you start to see an example of where government in this ecosystem is having a very beneficial impact on the whole ecosystem. And I say that, that's just an example, but you can start to see other areas where that would start to work, whether it's apprenticeship schemes, whether it's anything. You're starting to create this environment where just by doing this introduction, government is almost improving the standards of whatever it is that it's, it's trying to influence. So just to finish off, um, as I said, I talked about the pillars of the strategy. Um, a more data-driven government. One of the things that we're particularly interested in doing is really testing what that means. And just to give you a for instance, and I was talking to the two ministers about this last week. If you talk about a, a very current issue like housing, everybody's got an opinion on housing. But actually, a lot of that opinion is based on what I would call two-dimensional data. In other words, if you take where I live, so if you take County Dublin, we can probably tell you um, the amount of people who own their own homes. We can probably tell you the amount of people in, in public sector provided rental. And we can probably tell you the number of people in, broadly speaking, in, in private sector provided rental, or at least authorised provided rental. But what we can't tell you is why that happens. We sort of generally talk about there's not enough provision of this or there's not enough provision of that. But if you think about the number of people who live in County Dublin who aren't indigenous, a lot of them have a completely different culture towards house ownership than we do. And so for us to assume that everybody who's in rented accommodation wants to buy a house and can't is actually a bit misguided and naive. And it's the same for things like planning health care and, and uh, schools and so on. You know, we assume that everybody who lives in the West wants to stay there. But actually, you know, I know growing up, everybody, a lot of people who became my friends wanted to live and work in Belfast. A lot of people want to live and work in Dublin. So in some respects, we need to think differently about how we plan things. And thinking differently is actually asking those people who are affected, would they like to contribute to our policy making? And when you think of retail now, they do this all the time. If you, if you buy regularly from 
you know, Debenhams or Marks and Spencers or, or, or John Lewis or whoever it is, they will write out to you and say, do you like our, we're thinking of putting this in our autumn range, would you buy it? What material would you like it to be made of? What price point do you think it would be? What colours would you like? You know, so they, they're, they're into this all the time. We need to think, how does that affect how we provide government to our people? <clears throat> so I talked about increased sharing of infrastructure. This is all the boring part. But if we're going to fund big change in this, we've got to reduce the cost of back office. So nobody's particularly interested in back office when it comes to IT. But actually government has too many data centres and computer rooms and network lines and infrastructure and licences and all of those things. We need to just simplify that, reduce the cost of it, take the money we save and put it into stuff that matters. I, talk about, uh, I talked about the capability. We need to focus now on professionalism of our, of our people. We need to create an IT people who can think differently. And, you know, as I would say to them, we need to stop being experts in technology and start being experts in ICT-enabled change. And that's, that's almost going back to traditional things like being good at communications, being good at listening, you know, being good at planning projects, at benefits realisation and so on. So it's a challenge for us, but it's a change we have to make. I never talked about governance. It's all about being... As, as you put your eggs in one basket, you need to be better protecting the basket and getting that basket regularly measured so as you can prove to your stakeholders you're doing the best you possibly can to actually manage it for them. And if we do this, hopefully, there'll come a day when Ireland's top of the charts. So uh, I hope that was useful. I hope it's a useful start for a discussion and a debate. Very interested in having one. And thank you for your time this afternoon.